Well, welcome everyone to Summerland Baptist Church, our Sunday, May 23rd service. I'm Pat Fortune, Lead Administrative Director, and... Well, I'm Pastor Lee, I'm the Lead Ministry Pastor. How come I have to wear a jacket? You're not, you're not wearing a jacket. Okay, well, we're just going to start off with some in the know. Well, in big news, we had our annual general meeting for the Summerland Baptist Church mm -hmm. on Sunday night, and I would say the theme was backup. Agreed. Yes. We, yep. uh, within the first five minutes, one of our uh, our first camera failed, but... We had a backup. True. Yep. Uh, and then within about half an hour, one of the uh, video adapters out of my laptop, not yours, by the way, the reputation no. at that point was that it was yours. Yeah. My laptop actually failed. Yeah, we and had that, a backup. We did. And then yeah. that triggered the uh, loss of power to my laptop, which eventually went out as I was trying to edit some of the polls. So but we had a backup. We sort of had a backup. So, but other than that, um, tip, some of the highlights was a uh, pretty standard fare for the AGM. We had uh, outgoing board members and incoming mm -hmm. members approved. We had the budget approved. We had mm -hmm. the, uh, the review of the previous year's uh, expenditures. And then we had the uh, uh, considerable discussion on the, the uh, proposed sale of the Hunt Street property, which is, we can basically see it out the window here. Mm -hmm. It was unanimously approved for sale after uh, considerable discussion around some of the other options that we had been talking about. And uh, at the end of the day, it was an overwhelming in favor of, of sale at this point in time. You know, if you have any questions about the AGM or any information that we talked about there, but you weren't able to join, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we want to make sure that we communicate clearly and transparently. So if you do have any questions, if you want to have a conversation, uh, go for coffee or just even meet us both here at the church, we would love to meet with you and discuss that. From the CNF department, they wanted to remind parents that there's going to be a seminar with Darlene Unra on May 25th called 100 Little Sex Talks. Now, instead of having the big sex talk with your kids and just doing it once, the idea is that you have multiple sex talks with your children over a long period of time about healthy sexuality. So if you're interested in that, if you want more information, contact Bree in the CNF department. It is on May 25th, it starts at 6.30 and it will be available on Zoom. Also, some summer news for kids is the SBC day camp registration is now open. And so the day camp runs from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday. So if you're interested in registering your kids for that, you just go to summerlandbaptist.ca, our website, and that's where you can find the registration link. I know this is going to bounce off my skull, but you're in the better lighting here. Okay. Okay, okay we'll switch. So. Dustin has some announcements for the youth ministry. By the way, you know the youth pastor. He's the guy who's limping, right? Yes. Too much time at the skateboard park. Yeah. So, but uh, we have a number of different programs that he wanted to, uh, just to bring to the highlight. There's the Get Out program, grades 6 to 12, Tuesdays 4 to 6 p.m., which is hiking or biking. Wednesdays 4 to 6 p.m., Campfire Powell Beach. And Thursdays 7 to 9 p.m., Minecraft Online. So it sounds like it's something for everybody at youth, whether you love to be outside or you just want to go hang out at the beach or you want to play some video games online. I got something for everybody. Oh, Minecraft's a video game. Oh, okay. it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and from Adult Ministries, we have a couple of reminders from Dell, which is uh, Meet at the Beach, which happens Sundays at, I think it's two o'clock, isn't it? I think so. I think it's yeah. two o'clock. And uh, you have to register for it as well. And then as well, the annual grad bursary um, uh, email went out for the different options for supporting our grads um, moving forward mm -hmm. as they choose their different paths in life. Mm -hmm. I can't talk from this side of the table. This seems weird to me. I have to go back over there. <sighs> you just want the lighting. <laughs> hey, on June 13th, we're going to have a Celebrate Big Sunday. Now this weekend, we're doing some filming for a baptism but we could do baptisms anytime between now and June 13th. So if you're interested in being baptized, please reach out to the office, let me know, or any of our staff know, so that we can talk to you about that. Also on that Sunday, we're gonna do child dedications. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to Bree and the CNF team, and they'll get the information that you need. Lastly, we wanna celebrate with you all of those milestones that we've missed over the past year. Now we've been meeting together online only really since last March. So that is 14 months of not gathering as a large group. Well, because of that, I think we've missed out on a lot of milestones that happen in your lives that we do celebrate on Sunday mornings. Everything from new births in our congregation, whether it was a new child in your home or a grandchild that was born even across on the other side of the country, we always celebrate those things. Uh, we celebrate birthdays and we celebrate anniversaries. In fact, 
It's just your anniversary this week, it right? It was. 36 years. 36 Hi. years. Hi, honey. Happy anniversary, Thanks. Diane and Pat. But that's what I'm talking about. We miss these big milestones because we haven't been in the rhythm of meeting together, and we just missed them. Well, let's celebrate those milestones on June 13th. So if you can please send in a picture, give us the information, send in a little short video clip, anything that we could put together, you know, montage of celebration when it comes to the milestones in your lives. What's a montage? I don't know, the collection of pictures and videos. Isn't that how that works? And now you're... No, no, this is my lighting. Okay. okay. In the know. You're in the know.
all of my days I've been held in your hands Hoping that I wake Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the good Good morning, everyone. Let's just take a minute and pray together. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to take time and contemplate all that has gone in through history, all the effort that has gone in through history to put together the Bible, the books, the stories, the people, the authors, those that worked hard to pass on each letter, those that worked hard to pray and decide and build. Lord, we thank you for all the work through all history that you have done through your people to give us the Bible. We thank you for it. We thank you for your heart in it and that we can know you, know your character. And we ask today, as Pastor Lee leads us through some history, leads us through the process and the journey, the story of the Bible, we pray that you would speak to us, that we would hear your heart, we would hear your wisdom, your love for us, and your call for us to join you in this amazing story and vision for the world. So bless us as we listen and bless Pastor Lee as he shares and teaches that your name would be honored and that we would know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Stetler, I was reading my Bible today and I got so confused. I just wish I could go back and talk to Abraham and, and ask him some questions. Hey, you're old enough. You knew him, didn't you? <laughs> well, he was a little bit before my time, but, but uh, hey, I have a Bible question for you, Waldorf. How many animals did Moses put into the ark there before the flood? Well, I, I think it was two of every kind of animal, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was two. Well, or maybe it was more than that. It was neither, you old fool. Moses didn't put any animals into the ark. It was Noah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stadler, speaking of the ark, I sometimes figure that the Bible can't be true because considering how big that ark must have been to carry all those animals uh, along with all the food they would need and, and also Noah and his whole family, uh, I just can't understand how it's possible that later in the Bible it says that the ark was carried on the shoulders of just four scrawny priests. <laughs> 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 I know, I, I, I have so many questions about the Bible, like, like who actually wrote it? And, and where did we actually get it? Well, I don't know where you got yours, but I got mine from the bedside table at the Best Western Motel. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 hey, you know, I heard that Pastor Lee is going to be starting a whole new sermon series today called the Bible series, which will answer all of those questions we have about the Bible. Well, I sure hope it'll be better than his sermon last week. <laughs> it was just awful. Uh, yeah, that's true, it was pretty bad. It wasn't very good at all. Well, uh, uh, actually, it wasn't that bad. Uh, you know, he did make some good points. In, in fact, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I thought it was great. It was riveting. <laughs> I guess as they say in France, adios. Hey, uh, adios is not French. I, I know, but I, I don't speak French. <laughs> I was fascinated with the Bible as a kid. I loved the scripture stories. My mom would fill up my library with collections of books. Uh, one of the first collections I ever got, and maybe some of you are the same, was a Disney Book of the Month Club. And it was a bunch of Disney books that I probably collected 30 or 40 of them over the years. 
and they filled up an entire row on my bookshelf. One of the other collections that my mom started for me was a collection of Bible stories. And they were Old Testament and New Testament stories written in more of a novel format with pictures and illustrations in them, but definitely a chapter book. And it would be stories of Elijah and Elisha or Jonah or the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. But they were written in very narrative, very novel, you know, chapter book style writing. And I loved them. And I kept rereading them and rereading them and rereading them. And pretty soon, I used to read the Disney books all the time. And then pretty soon, I started to read the Bible series a lot more. And I was asking for more of those. And then one day, my mom just said, you know, you can find all these stories in the Bible itself. And I knew that because I'd grown up in church. And by the time that I was reading these stories, I was going to things like Boys Brigade and doing sword drills and knew where the books of the Bible were. And like, I understood that stuff. But for some reason, maybe the way the stories were written in these novels, and maybe because, you know, the, the Bible that I grew up with, I sometimes, I know I started with the King James Version, not the easiest one as a kid to read. But then the NIV came out, 1984, and I started reading it. It was a little bit more of like an easy language to read. And I went, okay, maybe I'll start reading the Bible. So I'd start back at Genesis, like most of us, and I'd start reading through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, losing interest, numbers, I have nothing, and, and that's the end. I wouldn't even make it into Deuteronomy, and I'd start all over again. Because I was trying to read it from front to back like a normal book, like how I was taught to read a novel. Not recognizing that instead, actually, this is a collection of books, and they're not even in chronological order, and they're not even in order of type. Well, not really. They kind of are. It wasn't until my mom and I had this conversation that she went, you should actually start at 1 Samuel. Start reading there. That's where all the stories that you like are. And I started reading 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. And I started reading through these stories of Israel, becoming a kingdom and all like Elijah and Elisha. And just, again, reading all of these fantastic stories. And then I started asking questions. Well, where did they come from and who wrote these? Because imagine at the beginning, I imagine God had a pen and was by itself was writing on a, on a, on a tablet or it was writing it itself on a, on a piece of parchment. And there was someone, a prophet standing there, someone like a Moses, right, or an Elijah, and they were standing there watching the pen just move. And that's how the Bible was written. That's how I thought. And then I learned that actually it was human authors that wrote it, but they were inspired by God. God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, was telling them the things to write down. Guiding them, guiding their hands, guiding their thoughts, guiding their memories. And then I said, well then, they have all these books. And then I realized when I got to Bible college, bigger questions started coming of like, well, there are other books that were written. There's other histories in the Jewish tradition as well as in the Christian tradition. Why didn't they get included? Like, why do we have these 66 books of the Bible? And why do we have this and not these others? And then I heard that there was a difference between the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible. And why is that? And so while I was at Bible college, you start to get some of these answers and you start digging into some of this. Well, as I was trying to ponder what kind of Bible series that we could go through. You know, my initial thought and the easiest place to land is to land on narrative stories. Let's look at some really cool narrative stories and see that path, that red line we often talk about from the very beginning in scriptures that go all the way through the end, this commonality of God reaching out to save his people. And maybe that would be a cool series, but then I realized there's a lot of us that either have forgotten or have never known even so some of the basics, some of the history that we have in, in, within the Christian church of how did this Bible even get put together? Because even in that, and today will be a little bit different. We're not going to go through passages of scripture. We're not looking at a, at a passage and breaking down here the three points that come out of it. We're looking at Christian history. This is a teaching class. But even out of that, I think God teaches us. We teach from, we learn from our context and we learn from our past. You know, the Bible is strange. It's weird. You don't read it from front 
to back. And unlike most modern books, the Bible is composed of a bunch of smaller books written by various authors, all who wrote in different times and in different places. Some would have had the ability to look at some of the other writing, and some didn't have any access to writing at all. So naturally, this raises questions then on how these books were even collected to form this single volume that we call the Bible. When did this happen? Who made those critical decisions, and why should we think they got it right? Now, this last question makes me uncomfortable, and I hope it makes you a little uncomfortable too. Why should we believe that they got it right? What makes us think that this Bible is correct? Just because someone has given it to us and said, here's the Bible, here's the Word of God, it's correct, don't ask questions. I'm uncomfortable with that. But I'm also uncomfortable with, I don't know if I want to know the answer. But this is a good question. How can we be certain they got it right? Now all these questions refer to what's known as the biblical canon. Now this term refers to the collection of scriptural books that God has given to his corporate people. It is just simply a collection of those spiritual letters, books, sacred texts that we have all agreed have been collected. This is the words of God for us, the church. Now questions regarding the canon can be divided into two broad categories, historical and theological. Now, historical questions about the canon pertain to when and how. When was it written? When did they decide to put the, when did they decide to put the canon together? What, you know, how did they decide to do those things? At what point in history do we see the Old Testament and the New Testaments collected into functioning book or collection? And what forces or individuals influence that process? Well, we're going to take a bit and we're going to work through the history of it. But there's also those theological questions, questions that are focused more on legitimacy and authority. Do we have a reason to think that these are the right books? And can we even know they're the right books? Before we get a little bit further, why don't we just pause here and pray that God would guide our conversation, guide our thoughts in our mind. Lord God, as we continue into this teaching, as we continue into this time together, Lord, I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts to what you would have for us. And we can learn a lot from history. We can learn a lot about process. And Lord, as it says in your word, that all scripture is God-breathed. We know this is your word. So Lord, as we unpack how the canon came to be, how you came to give us your word, Lord, I pray that you would be praised. Lord, I pray that we would be enlightened and that we'd be encouraged to dig deeper into the word that you gave us that points to you. Pray this in your name. Amen. Now here's some history. And I'm going to break down the history. Now I, you'll notice that I got a TV today. And I haven't had a TV in a long time or a PowerPoint presentation of any kind. But I realized that today as I'm starting to gonna go through a litany of dates, pretty soon they're all just going to start sounding the same. So at least if I put them up on here, you can kind of read them for yourself as we go through them. And I'm going to pause from time to time and talk a little bit about these. So between 45 and 85 AD is when the books of the Greek New Testament were written. Revelation being the last one. John on the island of Patmos wrote the book of Revelation somewhere between 80, 85, some even say as late as 90 AD. In 90 AD and in 118 AD, the councils of Jamnia gave the final affirmation to the Old Testament canon. Now, the Old Testament canon, I'm not going to really get into. We're going to talk more about the New Testament canon today, because really, there's not a lot of debate of what's to be in the Old Testament canon. It was pretty much decided by the people of Israel over a long period of time, but really got finally decided as the church at the, in these years. And there really isn't a lot of debate behind it, and so... We're just going to leave it there. But I wanted to throw that in there so you could kind of see a little bit of the timeline of that they, even the Old Testament canon, the collection of Old Testament writings from the nation of Israel, that wasn't solidified until after Jesus came as Messiah, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension to heaven. It was after all of that, which I actually find a little bit fascinating 
when you start thinking about the connection, and Dell's going to dive into this, the connection between the Old Testament pointing towards this Messiah, pointing towards Jesus, and when he finally comes, the Messiah finally comes, fulfills the Old Testament, is when they finally kind of get solidified on, here's the Old Testament text, Here, here's what we're going to keep of the history and the prophets of the nation of Israel. I don't think that's coincidental, but I'm just going to leave that there, and Dell's going to dive a little bit more into that later. In 140 AD to 150 AD, there was a, a guy named Marcion, and the, they call it the Marconian, so his name might be uh, Marcion. Um, he had this heretical New Testament, and what it means by heretical is that um, it was there was not um, orthodox teaching, orthodox being kind of standard, accepted um, theology, doctrine, practice, teaching, uh, all of the churches that were growing. Remember that the church early on is growing at a rapid pace, thousands at a time. And so there's all these small house churches, but they had a council of Jerusalem early on with the apostles. And then after the apostles were gone, then there's church fathers. And they started, you know, kind of organizing and, and, and uh, organizing themselves and, and sharing information and all these letters and things were getting passed around. Well, this guy named Marconian made his own kind of canon or collection. It's the very first collection that is recorded, but it only consisted of 11 books. One gospel, which was a shorter version of the gospel of Luke, and then 10 Pauline epistles. Well, the reason that he was heretical is that he rejected the rest of the apostles as true apostles. The actual disciples of Jesus, he rejected them as apostles and only wanted to follow Paul. He said, I'm a follower of Paul and Paul only. I reject Peter, I reject John, I reject Mark. And everyone was like, well, you, if you're a disciple of Jesus, and Jesus specifically told the 12 to go into all nations making disciples and baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, kind of this whole, you know, missional push that he gives to the disciples, who, t you know, we become the apostles and then pass that on to the rest of the church. You can't dismiss the people who are actually with Jesus. And so he was dismissed as heretical with some of his views. But what, the reason that I included this one is because very quickly after the first canon was the Maturian canon, which was compiled um, of 22 New Testament books. Because of that issue with Marconian, the church felt like they needed to start compiling. Here are the books that we believe are God-inspired. There needed to be a, an agreement or a unity around, here's what we're teaching, here's why we're teaching that. Because, I mean, just think about we, even within our own world today, within politics, within parenting, even within the church itself. There are lots of different kinds of opinions, and some things matter. You can have a, a difference of opinion, and we just say, well, I agree to disagree, but that's doesn't really matter. You can just, you are you and I'm me and that's okay. But there are some things that actually do matter. There is truth that is truth. And they found themselves as the church feeling like they were being separated and split apart. And so the church went, you know what, we need to kind of come up with a collection of scriptures, a collection of these letters that we're calling, uh, kind of teaching the word of God. They were already calling them scripture. We need to collect them. And so they came up with these 22 New Testament books, and the missing ones were Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and 3rd John. Now there are reasons, and we're going to get into the reasons of why these weren't included right at the very beginning, but right early on in 170 AD, they almost had the whole New Testament, and remember we talked about the Old Testament was already solidified with its 39 books by this time, so we were almost at a full, complete canon of what we have today by 170 AD. Now, 130 years later, Diocletian's persecution erupts. Now, I don't know how much church history that you've ever learned before, but this is truly the worst persecution the church has ever faced. They call it a bloodbath. Truly. It was horrendous. And that persecution included confiscating and destroying New Testament scriptures. 
It was the most severe of all church persecution. They were trying to wipe out the church for good. It was a little bit of a last-ditch effort. There had been persecution up to this point, but the church continued to grow despite all that persecution. And finally, all the opponents of Christianity went, we have to stamp this out once and for all. We need to get rid of their scriptures. We need to kill all the people. We need to just simply, like you would cut out a cancerous tumor, cut it out and have nothing left. And that, it was brutal. But in that, a lot of the scriptures, original manuscripts, things like that, they were destroyed. And so it, it gets us into some interesting territory pretty quick after that. And as you can see, almost as a result, a New Testament text, Lucian of Antioch, his Greek New Testament text, now becomes a foundation for later Bibles. Because of this persecution and because of all the destroying of manuscripts, they went, we have to get this down and we have to get this down accurately so that we can pass this on to generation after generation after generation. And this text becomes foundational for the future. This is three, well, 250 years after the, the writings were starting to get written. 250 years later. Moving on. In 367, this letter, Antithesis, I think, Athenius's, Greek words are hard to say, so pardon me for butchering it all. Festus' letter uh, completes the New Testament canon, 27 books for the first time. So this is the first time we ever see 27 books recorded anywhere as this is the official canon, this is the official collection of New Testament books. And then in 393 and 397, there was two councils. This was a gathering of church leaders from all over coming to Hippo and to Carthage, so like these North African councils, and they both affirmed at the time of 39 Old Testament and 27 New Testament books as authoritative. The canon is set in 397 AD, finally. There's not much debate after this. Well, that's not completely true, but for the time we have today, there's not much debate after this. This is where we're gonna stop. Now I have a couple of observations. The Christians were already using the New Testament scriptures as scriptures before the second century. The book of 2 Peter refers to Paul's letters as scripture. So in 2 Peter 3.16, for instance, it already was showing that there was, there was already a collection of Paul's letters being circulated and they were being regarded as on par with the Old Testament scripture. Similarly, in 1 Timothy 5.18, a saying of Jesus is scripture that the laborer deserves his wages. It was referred to as scripture. The only known match in the scriptures in the Old Testament or in the collection of writings is in the Gospel of Luke. So already when he's writing to Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, he's already regarding Luke, a gospel, as scripture. I find that interesting. When we talk about the validity of, well, how did they get from this letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, or this letter that Paul writes to Timothy, how did that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, become scripture? Isn't that just a personal letter to Timothy? Well, on one hand, he is. He's just writing to Timothy. This is his, a mentor writing a younger pastor, a leader in the church. He's trying to develop him. He's trying to give him some instruction. But within that, within the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, passing it on to Timothy very quickly, and we're going to get into some of those theological reasons in a minute, very quickly they began to realize this is more than just a personal letter. This is something that is good for all of us. The second observation is that they didn't rush the process. From the time the books were written to agreement on the which ones were in the canon, 300 years had passed. Agreement on the canon took over eight generations of prayer, discernment, study, and intentionally seeking unity. So just put that time, put that time into perspective. 300 years. Eight generations as a minimum went by while they were trying to decide what is in the canon or not. This seems like a pretty important thing, don't you think? 
what is scripture and what is not? How do we decide what's in and how do we decide what's not? And it took 300 years? It took eight generations. We have a hard time in the church, and I'm going to impact this a little bit later. We have a hard time hanging on for six months on a decision. I, if it takes a year to make a decision in the church, we're freaking out like this has taken forever. It took them 300 years, and yet the church continued to grow. The church flourished, even under persecution, under the bloodiest persecution the church has ever faced. And they didn't even have a collected, agreed upon collection of scriptures. They had the Holy Spirit. They had each other. They had some of the scripture. And God still did an amazing work. I want you to just put that thought in the back of your mind. I want to continue into theological discussions. The one thing I will say as we get into the theological discussion is there is a lot of history that I did not talk about, and there is a lot of even process that I'm not going to talk about either, because to be honest, this is a Bible college class in its entirety. You could do a whole seminary class just on the making of the canon and all the stories and all the history. We're trying to do it in 30 minutes. So we're skipping over lots. But this is really a wet the whistle kind of sermon. This is a, here's some interesting facts. Here's some things you maybe didn't know. Here's some, here's some teaching. But then where does that take us and how do you dive in deeper? So let's get into the theological things. So many people wonder how they decided which books to pick. Well, there was three different ways, three different basic criteria that they picked. Was the author an apostle or have close connection with an apostle? Is the book being accepted by the body of Christ at large? And did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? So let's unpack each of these things just a little bit. Was the author an apostle or have close connection with the apostles? Okay, well, there were 12 disciples and there was Paul. And those 13 are considered to be the apostles. Now, Judas was killed, so there was 11 disciples, but then he was replaced. So then there was 12, and then Paul got added as an after of the fact. He calls himself the least of the apostles because he persecuted Christ and because he didn't walk with as a disciple. He didn't get directly taught by Christ. He came to know him later. But those 13 have traditionally been seen as the apostles. But there are people like Luke, who is, wasn't considered an apostle. James, Jesus's brother. Jude, who also could be Jesus's brother. Or Jude could be just a pseudonym from Thaddeus, who then was an apostle. We're not exactly sure. And then Mark, who might have been one of the 72 disciples that was sent out, or it could be John Mark that we find in the book of Acts. Those are all the writers of the New Testament, not including the writer of Hebrews, who originally people thought was Paul, but later on and with more kind of scholarly insight, we're not exactly sure who wrote the book of Hebrews, and we can't definitively say that it was Paul, so it's just an unknown writer. Was the author or an apostle, or did they have a close connection? So Paul, Luke, James, Jude, Thaddeus, Mark, or John Mark, all had very close connections. They were either a part of the 72 disciples, so really a part of the disciples of Jesus, not one of the 12 necessarily, or they were very close to the disciples, or in Paul's case, almost uh, supernaturally made an apostle because of Jesus' appearance to him on the road to Damascus. There were a lot of letters that were being circulated, especially later on when we get past 100 AD, there were lots of letters that were being circulated that weren't necessarily written by an apostle and they weren't necessarily written by anyone directly associated with an apostle, but they still claimed authority. They still claimed God's spirit, uh, helped them write it, was inspired, and this is authoritative for the church. And one of the ways that they tried to break that down of what is in and what is out is the authority was given to the apostles to write the scripture so therefore, they had to be an apostle or have a very close connection with. Now, 
And the second one is, is the book being accepted by the body of Christ at large? And what I would call this is collective discernment by the Holy Spirit. So just as we vote on a yearly budget, we would call that collective discernment of, is this what God wants from us in our yearly budget? Are we being wise stewards of the money? Are we being faithful and are we stepping out in faith in knowing that God will provide? And collectively, we sense the Holy Spirit's leading and we vote according to that conscience. We vote according to the logic that's in our minds, we, the skills and the, the gifts that we have, but also in the listening to and obeying the leading of the Holy Spirit. So in the same way, over a long period of time, they went, are these scriptures, are these letters that are being accepted by the church that, yes, these are scriptures, these are authoritative, these are the words of God. And when they found kind of that everybody agrees, so very early on, remember in 170 AD, they had 22 or already universally accepted by all the churches. These are the scriptures. And then it just took a little bit longer for some of the peripherals, and there was those five. And then lastly, did the book, of, did the book contain um, consistency in doctrine and in teaching? And I'll just give you one example. The Gospel of Thomas was found actually as a really early written, and remember that it was a, an apostle was Thomas, so was it Thomas the apostle that wrote this, or was it someone else who wrote it later? They weren't exactly sure, but it had a funny kind of narrative to it, unlike the, can, um, the canon, and unlike the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it just went in a very different way than the rest. It wasn't a narrative account of the life of Jesus. It was more just of a collection of teachings of Jesus or a collection of parables. And that's all it was. And it seemed very out of line and very different than the rest. And they went, it just doesn't line up with everything else. So we're not going to include that as the word of God. It didn't mean that it wasn't important, and it didn't even mean that it wasn't used from time to time. It just wasn't seen as scripture. Now, some examples of not making the final cut are uh, the Didache, the teachings of the 12 disciples, or the 12 apostles, uh, the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, Apocalypse of Peter, the Epistle of Barnabas, and the Epistle of Clement. Um, these ones all like were down to the very wire of whether they would make the cut, or not. And their eventual exclusion was not actually because they were considered heretical. So they actually they passed um, number three. So if you look at this one, they passed kind of the, the doctrine orthodox teaching. But they either lacked um, apostleship, authorship. So this was either lacked number, number one. They lacked this. Or they thought maybe it was just a little shallow in its spiritual content. So maybe more a little bit here or this one number two, here. Now the simple and not so simple answer of how we ended up with the canon is not that God, is that God decided which book should be in the canon. He was the final determiner. And here's what I mean by that. J.I. Packer gives this quote, and I thought that this was really helpful to understand it. The church no more gave us the New Testament canon then Sir Isaac Newton gave us the force of gravity. God gave us gravity by his work of his creation, and similarly, he gave us the New Testament canon by inspiring individual books that make it up. I thought that was really helpful as a, how did we get the canon? Now, Sir Isaac Newton didn't make gravity. He just simply discovered it. And in the same way, the canon wasn't made up by men of them just kind of choosing the ones that they liked, and it seemed like it was all going in the right direction, and it looked like these were, you know, pretty authoritative, so let's just go with that. The canon ultimately was decided by God, by His Spirit, leading and directing the entire process. But it's the Spirit of God that led the authors to write it in the first place, not but by their hand, but by His. Not a physical hand like I thought at the beginning, but inspiring them and giving them the words to say and the memory to write down all of what Jesus said in kind of this a supernatural way. If we really believe that this is the word of God, if we really believe that God is omniscient and, and all-powerful and all-knowing, that he really is the I am, that he has always been, he is, and he always will be, it is not a very far stretch in faith then at that point to go, well, then he also guided and directed the very words that he wanted us to know. As we conclude today, there was a few things that came out. They were patient. 
The church was patient. It took 325 years to put together the canon. Generation after generation worked at it until they had it right. You know, we get so frustrated sometimes on how long it takes us to make decisions by committee, and I talked about this a little bit earlier. Now, I'm not saying that we should take 300 years to decide on what carpet to use in the sanctuary or what, si what style of desks we should have in our offices. I'm not saying we should take 300 years to decide on what staff person we're going to add next to our church or what ministry we're going to jump into or what kind of community involvement would make a difference here in Summerland. We can't afford that kind of time. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is that sometimes I think we need to be a lot more patient in the decision-making process. Sometimes it's just clear and you move ahead and you feel confident and you feel led. At our AGM, we made some votes and the votes were very clear. In the upper 90% all the time for each of the votes. And so then it gives me a confidence of I feel like we are being led by the Holy Spirit to have consensus. But that's not always the case, is it? Sometimes we do make mistakes. But the perspective I wanted to say that even in the making of mistakes is that for 300 years, even in all of the mistakes and all of the arguments and all the heresy and all the persecution and all the difficulties that the church went through, God still consistently guided them through it. One might look at 170 AD and they didn't have five of the canon in there that they made a terrible mistake. They should have added those five in there. They should have known all the way back then. And for the next 130 years, it, you know, it took the church to, to kind of figure out how to get it all right. I, I don't think they made a mistake. I think they just simply were doing the best they had with what they had at the time. And God continued to guide and direct and bless them during that time, including that time of horrendous persecution. Secondly, they relied on the Holy Spirit, both in process of discovering the canon, but also in the life and teaching of the early church. What we have today as scripture is more accessible than any other time. I have my phone here. I can look up any scripture I want. I have my full Bible right here, and I can look up scriptures anytime I want. Not only can I look up the scriptures, but the amount of different translations in all of the different languages. And now on the internet, there are Bible study tools that if I really don't understand something, I can just go into those Bible study tools and start to really break down original language. And where else in the scripture can I find the similar words? And what is the context there? And really trying to unpack what's in there. The early church just had a bunch of writings that weren't even collected in a nice little organized form like this. And yet the church blossomed and grew how much more could we blossom and grow now that we have a collected canon of scripture? You know, this series is not meant just to just get some information and then move on. What I'm hoping for, what Dell is hoping for, is that it kind of gets us a little bit excited of like, well, then what is in there? Over a long period of time, there was this big trying to figure out what goes in and what doesn't, and and it took over 400 years, and well, well, what's in here? What does it say? And it's not that we treat the Bible as an idol. I think that is, you know, one of those, those difficulties that, that we can fall into if we start kind of careful on how we treat the Bible. I'm not saying we don't respect, of course. But ultimately, the Bible isn't to be known just for the sake of knowing the Bible. The Bible is what actually points us to the God that we serve. As I read into the scripture and as I understand the authorship and I understand I get to know the authors that are, that are a part of the writing process, I'm also getting to know God. I'm getting to know his character. I'm getting to know what he wants for me and how he wants me to change. The scriptures are a key part of our faith and our growth and understanding of who he is. So I've got some homework for you this week. Dig into the scripture. Maybe you have, it's been a while since you've dug into it. Maybe you do it faithfully every day. But dig into it this week. Maybe look into some of the historical books. Look at the her history of the early church. Maybe read the book of Acts 
and start looking at how the church came together and what they did for teaching and how they spread the gospel in those early years. Get to know some of the stories of those human authors that wrote those letters. Paul, Peter, John, James. And as you get to know them and get to know their story, you'll also get to know who God is and how he's a part of your story. The pages that they wrote point us to God. They point us to Jesus. Thanks for joining me today. Steve is going to close our service by singing some songs.
upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. Oh
Awesome.